sense of, of, um, of joy in having their child with them and the sense of hope, um, of real hope that's on the horizon to be able to, to save their child is, is, is really just an amazingly different um, uh, uh, vantage point, if you will, to abundance. And, um, you know, I think about um, abundance and well-being and, um, and, you know, it just, it's hard to even it's hard to even put in the word in in words, but I will tell you there's real hope, and there's real joy in the sense of abundance around the fact that they have this child, no matter how many challenges that child has. Yeah, that's neat. Welcome, Rick. Thank you so much. That's incredible, Laura. Love what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah. we are we are officially live. Good. Good. So Laura, Laura, went, Laura went first just on her background with helping uh, rare, disease, rare diseases and, and how that well-being goes with the families and, and, the, and the, those kind of kids. So, Yeah, I love that. Wow, very cool. Um, Jeff Badu, can you go next? And we're yeah. talking, of course, you know, we're talking about global abundance well-being going beyond GDP. So can you speak to that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, overall, you know, the world needs global abundance. Um, the world needs abundance. And for me, it all started with a book that I read when I was a kid, you know, also known as the good book. And with that, it taught me that life is meant to be abundant, right? That in life, you essentially, we, not that we're entitled to abundance, but we all deserve, we all have an opportunity to live in abundance. And for me, when I was eight years old, I discovered my purpose in life. Um, I'm sorry, when I was 16 is when I discovered my purpose. When I was eight, I came to the United States of America to learn more about abundance because I had infinite resources that were available to me. But then at the age of 16 was when I discovered my true purpose, which is to inspire and support the super hungry to take over the infinite resources in order to create an abundant lifestyle. So within that purpose, you know, I ultimately see that abundance goes, it, it can be for anybody. Anybody can achieve abundance. Anybody can attain abundance and we truly deserve to be abundant. We just need to take hold of those infinite resources so that whenever we have something at our fingertips, we're able to use that, we're able to capture that, we're able to take hold of that to create that abundant lifestyle. I love how you're talking about infinite resources and to create that abundant lifestyle. You know, I know after COVID, especially opt optimism for the future is on the decline. It's actually fallen 19% with only 4% feeling optimistic about the future. Um, that's compared actually to 59% who felt optimistic about the future a year ago. So can you connect the two? Yeah. Can you repeat that just one more time? Yeah, just optimism for the future is on the decline, especially after COVID. So just far fewer people all over the world are actually optimistic about the future. So what you're saying is we can put infinite resources into the hands of, of everyone. And no matter who you are and where you are, uh, they can experience an abundant lifestyle. Am I correct? Yeah, that is exactly correct. Absolutely. Wow, that's that's incredible. And so, Yvonne Badu, co-founder and CEO of Badu Life and Health Solutions. The fact that you are in charge of both life and health, uh, we're so excited to have you here on this panel. And, you know, who better to speak to this than you? Uh, I just love your heart for people. And so in the context of global abundance, well-being, going beyond GDP, uh, can you just share with us some of your wisdom? Thank you, Rick. Um, first and foremost, you know, thank you for giving me this platform. I'm so honored to be here with you all. Um, when I think of abundance, I first think of, you know, the foundation that uh, people start from. Um, I am a registered nurse currently, 
Um, I plan to work with uh, children very soon. Uh, I actually do uh, work with children now. I am you know, the vice president of the Badu Foundation, which uh, provides financial literacy to children ages six to 18. Uh, we teach them budgeting, uh, savings, which is very important. We do not have uh, those types of opportunities or education in our school systems currently. So uh, starting this uh, foundation with my husband is, you know, it's huge. We definitely plan to expand on that. Um, we feel that having this foundation for children will help them create abundance uh, for themselves moving forward. Um, Come, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Rick, uh, we, we're just coming from, you know, dark times, a pandemic. So um, when I uh, think of abundance, uh, I think of love and human compassion. Uh, what better way to create abundance than to implement love in everything that we do and to have compassion uh, for human life? Um, as a registered nurse, you know, I'm always working with people. Uh, we're, we're constantly um, caring for people, uh, spreading hope in their lives while they're in their darkest moments. Um, it's very important for us to spread compassion to these people um, because, you know, they, they're, they might be in their last, you know, breath. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially during COVID, um, not a lot of families were able to see the people that they loved. Uh, the only people that they were able to see were, you know, nurses, doctors. Um, so it's it's up to us as healthcare professionals, you know, to um, initiate that spread of compassion for human life, um, so that we can influence others as well. Um, I know it, it sounds cliche, um, you know, uh, how do we spread love? You know, everybody wants to spread love, but I think it definitely starts with, uh, it starts in the hands. Um, so my purpose is to uplift families, to be their true selves, and to be, uh, to reach for something greater than themselves, no matter what. And what that means to me is, you know, to it starts in the home, family unit. It's very important um, to spread love to our children, show them how to love, show them how to influence others um, in the best way that they can. And uh, from that influence, you gain abundance. We uh, make the world a better place. We make our businesses better. We, um, you know, we make our home lives better. We make ourselves better in that way. So it's very important to, you know, start start with the children, influence them in the best way, uh, show them what compassion uh, for others mean mm -hmm. and what it means to them and how they value themselves as well. Wow. It's always a good reminder to start with the children. Do you believe that, COVID-19 has improved the compassion of leaders everywhere? Um, I, I definitely see that it has. Um, there's still so much work that can be done because, you know, there's a lot of reparations that we have to uh, go through. But um, I definitely see a bright future in our leaders and our future leaders as well. Wow. Does anyone have a question for Yvonne? I'm going to come back to Laura Hamid, executive director, uh, once again. And uh, I, I'd like you to speak to just the work you're doing briefly. And how does this improve a global abundance well-being? Um, well, I, I mentioned a little bit, I think, Rick, right before you got on about um, kind of our, our focus. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, just to take it to maybe 200,000 feet. Um, as opposed to where I was, um, I'll, I'll go back to something my dad always told me when I was a kid, which is there's many reasons why you don't do something and there's very few reasons why you can't. 
And I think about the global abundant well-being mindset or the abundance mindset, if you will. It's almost knowing that you can and then taking the action to do so. And so I think about how we deliver cures to children with ultra rare diseases. And there's a traditional mindset, there's a traditional model, and then there's a new model. And there are all sorts of reasons why the new model is hard, why the new model doesn't quote work, why, why you know, all sorts of hurdles and things like that. But all you have to do is, is, is watch, a, watch a dad, a dad named Terry, who's in Toronto, and he gets a, a diagnosis for his little Michael. And he says, it's not okay for me to just sit back and let Michael fail. I will do whatever it takes to clear away the hurdles to ensure that Michael has access to that cure. Now, Michael's lucky because he has a dad who's able to do that, who has the ability to essentially become a citizen scientist. I wish every single one of the 300 million people with rare diseases had a cherry in their life, but they don't. So we have to equalize this, this concept. And if you can take that mindset of I'm going to clear away the hurdles and I'm going to develop this not just for my kid, but for all the other kids with this disease, that um, takes it from being local to being global. And it takes that abundant mindset and it, it supercharges it. So I think about uh, this mindset standpoint, which you've just given me the gift to really stop and think about as um, as taking away the the why you don't and putting the focus on on why you should. So it just uh, take, takes away the negative and leans forward into the positive. And I, I think about Terry and what he says about Michael as such a great exemplification of an abundant mindset in the face of a lot of challenges. Mm, that's powerful. 300 million in the 300 world million. are affected by rare diseases. And I love that, you know, just that simple idea of knowing you can and taking the action to do so. And I think if we just start there, there's so many people, you know, as we've worked across countries that you don't see that knowing you can. And they've got to know that this, you know, global abundance well-being is total abundance well-being and that that is actually doable, that abundance is available and of course, you know, other countries that are already further along helping these other countries that aren't thriving, maybe struggling or barely surviving. Right. Uh, you know, should should seriously consider helping in any way that they can, because it's you know, we don't get abundant at the expense of someone else staying in scarcity. We all become abundant. We all rise when we all rise. When when everyone is abundant, we all win. And so. Anyway, and I love the, the mention of, of the new model and then and the idea of clearing hurdles as well. So thank you, Laura. Does anyone have a question for Laura? Let's transition to Norm Harshaw, CEO of King and Justice Abundance Day. We've got an incredible panel here. So these are all people that are in the trenches of the real world, handling uh, abundance, well-being in some way, shape or form, meaningful, extraordinary ways. And so Norm is is uh, in charge of the first and only total abundance, well-being solution. And so, Norm, can you speak to global abundance, well-being? Exactly. And you really piggyback on, on Laura and Von and Jeff. Um, just what they were talking about well being for, for the kids and well being for everybody. Um, so many people think of abundance just financial, and we, we know it's not just that. And that's what we got to really get over is that everyone in the world can be abundant. Doesn't matter their resources, doesn't matter where they live. Um, it's all about kind of a, what I call a joy index. Um, you know, I, I've traveled the world, I've, I've been in third world countries, and I've seen kids uh, playing soccer or football, you know, with a, with a rag uh, wrapped in tape, and they're, they're joyful, and they're loving it. Um, and then I think of my own kids uh, playing Xbox and they're complaining, um, they get bored with it, there's nothing to do. But, right. And that, that blows me away, so... We want to bring we want to bring abundance to the world, and it starts with joy. And um, sure, financials part of it, but but how do we get uh, joy into the into the kids in 
in Africa and, and India, all over the world. Um, they can have joy uh, in the family just like we can have joy in our family or joy in their friends like we have joy. So abundance really is, is starts in the heart, starts in, starts in the head about uh, just joy, personal joy, uh, which leads to abundance in all things. Wow. What do you feel like uh, well-being is be- is becoming this? It's not just trending. It's gone mainstream. And, you know, the vast majority of organizations across all organizational types are paying lip service to the idea that that well-being is important. And yet uh, a large percentage, more than 50 percent, don't have any real strategy for it. And so I know that's a that's a challenge. But the other big thing I see is they're they're beginning to link well-being with happiness or, as you're saying, joy. I, I prefer joy over happiness. So how do you how would you suggest we close the gap between well-being and joy? Well, yeah, happiness, happiness is, is more of a feeling and, and anyone can say they're happy, but to have true joy um in with your friends to joy at work are, are we in, how's your joy index at work are you joyful at work if you aren't then then you're missing something out of life and so well-being is is a joy uh is a joy trend um so we just got to find it there, there's ways to get it there's the abundant abundance day um you know everyone can learn it we can teach it so it's it's really the, and really the companies given their 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 workers and employees time to to succeed in life as well as at work wow does anyone have a question for norm don't all jump at once <laughs> uh i have a question so Please. norm uh in what ways can we uh spread joy um, especially uh, in people that, you know, are struggling or, you know, struggling to find joy in their life? Yeah. Great question, Yvonne. You know, it's, it's we first of all, we have to have joy in our life. We have to find joy in ourselves. And then just look, look for ways to, to encourage people, to spread joy, spread uh, positivity. Um, speaking to people's lives, even, even as I'm walking through the grocery store, I, I just notice people now that I, that I never did before. Um, and, and just try to speak more into people's lives. And that's the, the best way to bring joy is just to notice people and give them a hand, give them a, give them a smile, um, you know, give them a hello. For those that you don't know, for those of you know, call them up and just try to, you know, Give them, give them some encouragement. Just note, I think really just noticing people and noticing your surroundings more can bring joy to yourself and other people more. I like this a lot because we often say a leader only has two jobs. This applies to world leaders, leaders of cities, of organizations, even families, communities, every leader is that uh, architect of the future, job number one, job number two is guardian of the mood. And so I like the idea of architecting the future in the context of well-being and guardian of the mood in the context of joy. That to me is a fascinating paradigm of possibility. So Monique Justice, co-founder and CEO of King and Justice, solving abundance for humanity. I'd love for you to speak to this idea of global abundance, well-being, going beyond GDP, gross domestic product, to gross domestic well-being. Sadly, we're unable to hear. And so I know, let me speak to this. You know, one of my, I guess you could say, gifts is just simplifying complexity. The idea of you know, global abundance well-being, you know, you can read a lot of things, you know, so people are, are, are tackling it all over the world. And yet, you know, I see that they're struggling with what are the right things to measure? 
what really is this thing called total abundance well-being. So some will suggest, you know, five elements or and then some are focused on just lifting certain countries and people out of poverty. And, and that's important. And yet, so how do we actually speak to global abundance well-being? And so let me simplify this and just paint a, a holistic picture. And this is literally for leaders everywhere. And world leaders, please pay attention to this. Number one, spiritual growth. So having a spiritual index that that factors in the the right parameters, the right things. You know, that could be re- religious diversity, religious population, religious freedom, religious tolerance, spiritual sites, wellness, quality of life. There's a lot of things that could be factored in. But I think the very first element or ingredient of global abundance well-being is spiritual growth. Number two is personal transformation. And so what opportunities are you giving your people, whether in an organization or a city or a country and really a world that enables people access to education and to Jeff Badu's point, infinite resources that enable them to to transform uh, personal development. So number one was spiritual growth. Number two is personal transformation. The third is emotional well-being. You might think of this as mental health or other ways, but emotional well-being is is one of the absolutely critical, essential elements of of this abundance well-being. Number four is love relationship. My point here is not to expound on each of these. I'm introducing 12 essentially universal fields um, for total abundance well-being. So number four is love relationship. Number five is family. Number six is work. Number seven is fun and leisure. Number eight is friends and social circle. Number nine is physical health. Ten is giving. Eleven is financial abundance. And twelve is home environment. If we are to go beyond the simple or single metric of GDP as a way of determining how well our economy or our global economies are doing, then we need to have an answer and a holistic understanding of what total abundance well-being is. We have to essentially think globally If we're going to have global abundance well-being, that's globally everywhere in the world and every country in it, all people included in it. There's so much data that we can't put our hands on in so many parts of the world because people are not included. And so it's really hard to determine how well these people are doing. So global abundance well-being is, of course, for everyone, all of humanity everywhere, but it is simultaneously global in that you have to have a global view, a holistic view of what what abundance well-being is. And so these 12 things, I'm going to run through them here again in a moment, gives us a starting point. How can you benchmark global well-being anywhere if we don't really know what global or total abundance well-being is? How can we effectively even truly begin to go beyond GDP if we haven't defined what total abundance well-being is. And so again, number one, spiritual growth. Number two, personal transformation. Number three, emotional well-being. Four, love relationship. Five, family. In case you're writing this down, I'm going slow. Six, work. Seven, fun and leisure. Eight, friends and social circle. Nine, physical health. Ten, giving. Eleven, financial abundance. Twelve, home environment. So I think once we have this whole view of a life, then as leaders of our own lives, because we must promote it with ourselves first, 
and then to those we care about and love around us, and then may that extend to the community and beyond. And so when you have these 12 things, now we can be clear about what it is. And so then I said, these are 12 fields wherein you identify your highest values as an individual, as an organization, as a country. I don't mean to leave out the cities. And so you can't dictate necessarily my values aren't your values, but we can all agree that these are the 12 universal fields, fields in which we can all play. And so when we lift the total abundance well-being in every area of our lives, not just financially, but and financially, then we will all become increasingly abundant. We have all the resources. We have enough technology with everything we currently have in the world. We have enough to solve abundance, including total abundance, well-being for all people. Does anyone want to speak to this? Any questions? Is that how does that land for you? Just hearing that there's 12 in total and how will that enable us to accelerate global abundance, well-being as leaders all over the world? Can you can you hear me? Yes. OK, I'll speak quick. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I want to add to that, that it gives you a more holistic view. So many times we just separate. We're separating work and we're separating life. No, they are intertwined. Our, the way we show up in our own personal health is going to be showing up in our productivity in our organizations, whether it be work, whether it be our own businesses, whether it be a country, whatever we are doing. And so that helps understand the areas that we need to actually love, or you can say invest for your best ROI. Your best re return on investment are people. That's the biggest asset into an organization. And it's also the biggest asset regarding um, if you're a when you're a leader of a country or a city or a leader of your home. That's the biggest asset are the people in your home. And um, Rick, when, I don't know. I don't want to take too much time away from you, but I have a few statistics that are interesting regarding the well-being. If, Please. Okay. Well, there's a 48% greater likelihood that people with low engagement and well-being will leave your organization. 48%. That's not okay. That's not okay. So it's really imperative that we actually focus on the well-being of people. Um, there is a 15% greater likelihood that direct reports will be thriving in well-being when their leader or manager is thriving. How many leaders of organizations or in any um, are thriving? 15% greater likelihood. There's going to be more fun. Um, a whopping 710 mill millennials experience at least some burnout on a job. Well, we can't afford that. Everybody can be burned out because they're not doing well in their personal life. And then we can talk about presenteeism alone. So presenteeism, um, there literally is, um, there's mental health related to presenteeism now costing organizations. And it's it's crazy, nearly 70% of organizations were reported over leadism last year. So there's just so many things that are intertwined with our success in life. That's going to return our best investment financially, if you want to talk about financially. Um, that's actually going to give us exponential growth. So I know that our biggest asset are people. And um, we have products, we have services, we have everything else in this world. But the greatest asset are those human beings. And that's the best thing that we can do is invest in them for their well-being. How would you guys like to respond to that? <laughs> well, I think that, you know, you blend what the two of you just just said together. And, and it occurs to me that by its nature, the GDP concept is intended to be very comparative. It's in, it, it's that's its intent. And yet the well-being concept is intended to be very collective. 
So it's almost like it, it's um, GDP starts with them, but well-being starts with us. So there's ownership in that sense of collectivity and there's ownership in that sense of, of it starts with me. And so I think that just by their nature, they're two very different things. And, and I get why there has to be those, those uh, you know, financial measures, those uh, metrics. And, you know, if you can't move it, you can't. It, what, what did they say? If you can't measure it, you can't move it. Right. But it goes back to we've got to place greater value on measuring the intangible. Um, and connecting that to well-being. So it just occurred to me that the comparative versus collective might be um, almost opposite vantage points um, that we're looking at. That's that's quite profound, and I really appreciate that, comparative versus collective. I think you're absolutely right. Yvonne, in the past 10 years, improvement in health and healthcare led to a 24% increase in income growth in some of the poorest countries. Right. So there's just there's there's clearly a link between health and health care and income growth, uh, whether you're one of the poorest countries or one of the, the wealthiest countries in the world. How does that land for you? Yes. Um, you know, health is very important. You know, um, you mentioned 12 practices. I, I do believe, um, you know, health is definitely intertwined with that. If uh, people, if we're not investing in our health and our well-being, how are we going to help others, right? How are we going to improve all the things that, you know, we need to improve to create abundance in our life? So it's very important to uh, put investment into, you know, healthcare. It's, you know, it's a growing industry. Um, and I think that uh, it definitely needs to be taken seriously because it does affect a lot of, you know, different um, different avenues. Um, so, it's, yeah. Wow, it's incredible. And I also know stress, burnout, and anxiety are the top well-being risks impacting, you know, really the performance of individuals and every organizational type. Yes, most definitely. Um, burnout is, you know, it's it's very serious. Uh, it definitely reduces productivity in so many ways. Um, people lose value in what they're doing when they're, you know, burnt out. So it's so important to uh, place value in health. Mm. So Jeff, Finland is supposedly the happiest country for four years in a row. <laughs> Iceland's number two, Denmark's number three, Switzerland's number four, Netherlands is number five, Sweden's number six, Germany's number seven, right? And it goes on, Norway is number eight, New Zealand's number nine, Austria's number 10. We keep going. Right. 11 is Israel. 12 is Australia. 